Verse 17, for God hath put in their hearts. Now, isn't that interesting? Notice that God is the one who put it in their hearts to do the action. It wasn't their own doing. It wasn't Satan. Yes, it is the Satan. Yes, it is their own doing. But we know who's ultimately the one in control of everything, right? Satan can't do things without God's permission, you've got to realize. So the Lord did this, why? To fulfill his will. He has a will that must be fulfilled, and that's, and to agree. See, these ten kings are going to agree with each other. They're going to combine forces together to go against the Catholic Church. And give their kingdom unto the beast. So notice right here, it says, they have an agreement that they're going to give their kingdom to the beast. Ooh, that's the key over there. You might say, what is that? If this is their kingdom, it makes more sense by going by the club of Rome, Catholic, on what they claimed they're going to divide their territories with, the ten, with ten different groups under ten kings. Why? Because they have to betray her because this is her kingdom. Because this is her kingdom, they have to betray her. And then why? So that they can give it fully to the Antichrist. Why? Because the Antichrist ain't here anymore. Where is he at? He's in Jerusalem at the temple. That's where he's at. It's amazing how there's this betrayal back and forth. So you see that the Antichrist, who is Roman, okay, by religion, Roman by religion, he betrays the Jews. And then when he lives in the land of the Jews, he betrays his Roman power. Why? All he can think about is himself. That's why never trust the devil to make a contract with. Amen. He will always lie to you, deceive you. And that's what he did with the Roman Catholic Church system. He betrayed them. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. This is so then God's word has to be fulfilled. That's why verse 17, God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. This is all under the will of God. So while they think that everyone's doing their own thing, this guy thinks he's doing his own thing, this guy's thinking he's doing his own thing, she's thinking she's doing her own thing, and then God's like, no, I'm still on the throne, I'm still in control. Amen. And this is just fulfilling my words. So think about all the people who are angry with the globalists today. You know, you can go for Rockefeller, Gates, Fauci, Bilderbergers, whoever, but it don't matter. The reason why is, is that all of them, they're just little guys, man. All of them chasing for power. All of them chasing for power. But then guess what happens? The Lord says, hey, I'm still in control of you. So Bill Gates ain't in control. It's God today. It's not uh, the globalists in charge today. It's God. It's not China. It's God. It's not the elitists. It's God. It's not the... It's not the CFR, Trilateral Commission, etc., etc. It's all God. It's not the Roman Catholic Church system. It's God. He's on the throne. He's in control. So what I don't understand is why do people panic about what's going on? Look, don't worry about what's going on with this COVID-19 situation because we are God's people. God takes care of his own children. Not only that, we know that our time is coming where we're raptured before the tribulation. Okay. So everything that's going on, the 6 to 6 bill and then pe tr people trying to push in vaccines and then the lockdown and all that, you got to realize this, all of this is what? God's will. All right? All of this is God's will. Where the Ninth Circuit Court won their case against the churches, all of that is God's will. A lot of people try to resist this, try to resist the government, trying to fight back, trying to win, trying to retain their freedom. Don't get me wrong, it's good that we try to use the privilege and freedom that we have and right, use it, because right. Paul used it. Yeah. But Paul even realized the, uh, the fate where if Christians are persecuted, that he says, be persecuted for Christ's sake. Right. So if, there, if you've done all you could do, and it's not realistic on what you can do to change the world, then just trust the rest in God's hand. I don't know why people are panicking, getting upset, you know. All right, let's look at verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. So notice over here that the Roman Catholic Church, the whore is the city. So there's no doubt this is all a picture, a representation 
Over and over again, we see that. She is the city. That's what the verse says. That's what the whore is. It's a city. If she is known to be as the city, then let's see what happens to this great city here. Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So it's a one city that rules over all kings around the world. That should prove to you it has to be the Vatican, Vatican City. Why? Because there is no city in the entire world that has power over nations around the world. To say it's America, that don't make sense. It's not Washington, D.C. Right. No, Washington, D.C., they don't take charge over all the kings of the world, but Vatican City does. Look at all presidents. What do they do? They, they bow down before the Pope. They all bow down before the Pope. See, all of this, you got to understand over here, is, has to be referring to the Roman Catholic Church system. Not only that, for people to say that it's referring to the United States of America, that's not true. Babylon the Great is not the United States. You might say, why? Because this is talking about a city, it's not talking about a nation. Babylon, I know throughout the Bible, it's known as a nation. But God sees in the future, it's going to aim at a particular city. It's going to aim at a particular city. Okay, let's look at chapter 18, verse 1. Chapter 18, verse 1. Okay, here are some more interesting stuff over here we're going to cover. And after these things, so after John saw everything at Revelation 17, right? I saw, now look at this. It says, after these things I saw. That is very important. People can't just keep looking things at a time clock, time sequence. So it's after what John saw, this revelation, he's seeing another revelation. So remember, you have to group revelation in that way. When you divide the chapters and verses, you can't divide it by time orderly sequence. You have to divide it by revelations, different things and visions of what John saw. That's why revelation is not in chronological order. So here's a different outlook now that John is seeing. He sees another angel come down from heaven, right? Having great power. The angel has a lot of power. And look at this. The earth was lightened with his glory. So when the angel comes down out of heaven, his presence, his glory, so to speak, it lights up throughout all the world. Now remember, what did Jesus say about the believers in Christ? Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now think about this, is that if we were to go all the way back, if we were to go all the way back in, our, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so remember angels do not have wings, but I'm just drawing this as, uh, that way people can better understand through pictures. But the angel over here, he's supposed to have a glow. The Bible shows, 1 Corinthians 15, about our resurrection. Jesus said at the book of Matthew that our resurrection, we will be like who? The angels in heaven. And 1 Corinthians, if the angels have this glow around them, we saw that Revelation 18.1, right? Angels have a glow. They have a glory and we're going to be like them, that means we Christians will have a glow too. So when we, when we go to heaven, we're going to have a glow. Amen. Now think about this. This makes sense then that before Adam retained his human image, his earthly image, before he had the image of who? God. That's why angels are known as sons of who? God. They retain his image there. So that means over here that that's why it makes sense God is light. In him there is no darkness. God has glory and a glow. The angels have it too. Believers share that too. Then Adam and Eve, that means, before they fell, they had a glow about them. But think about it. In the ad lib commentary, Dr. Uckman interestingly says that when Eve partook in the fruit, what happened when Eve partook in the fruit, that glory, that glow was lost. Isn't that interesting? All right, so look at 1 Corinthians 15. 
<coughs> excuse me, the Bible says over here, verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So notice it's referring to this glow, this light. That's what it's talking about. So it says over here, concerning about the celestial bodies, that they retain this glory. Verse 49, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, see, no glow, right? We shall also bear the image of the what? Heavenly. Just like the heavenly star, sun, moon, etc., so all of them have a glow. We're going to have a glow. Man, that's going to be something. That's why I'm, uh, it's very interesting that the Grecian myths, what they do is that when gods come down among humans, that they have this glow. The Disney movie, Hercules, it gives an interesting thing where he went from a man state to a, like a god state, so to speak, where there's this glow about him. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. So before at the garden, they had this glow about them, but then that glow was gone. That glow was gone when they partook in the fruit. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 18, and we'll read verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. So the angel, remember, he went down, went upon the earth, lighting the whole earth with his glory. And now he's giving a very huge cry with his voice, a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. So notice right here, he's talking about Babylon is falling apart. Why? Because chapter 17 shows it. So now, let's talk about some interesting things over here. Some people think that this fall of Babylon in Revelation 18 is a different fall of Babylon from Revelation 17. They claim that there are two different falls of Babylon, and they call Revelation 18 the commercial Babylon because if you read Revelation 18, this seems more of something that has to do with merchandise and commerce. Look at verse 3, you'll notice that. If you read verse 9, you'll notice that. Verse 12 and verse 11, you'll notice that. All of this has to do with commerce, something secular. Whereas Revelation 17, you'll see more of that as a spiritual religious Babylon. So that's why some people like Larkin, they'll say that it's two separate Babylons. However, I agree with Dr. Ruckman over here that it has to be referring to the one and the same Babylon. Now you might say why. The reason why is because it's following by context. If you look at chapter 17, it's talking about at verse 16, her fall. And then chapter 18 is continuing and describing the story of her fall over there. So it makes logical sense from looking at context. This is referring to the same Babylon. A second thing is this. A second thing is that uh, why can't you mix up a commercial with a religious spiritual Babylon together? I mean, if you think about Vatican City, that is the perfect example of mixing up politics and religion. It is the best city in the entire world and throughout all of history that combines secular and religious power together, even today. There's no other city in the entire world that fits better in the bill than Vatican City. Not only that, look at the wordings over here. So, it is, chapter 18 consists of spiritual Babylon, you got to realize. You might say, really? Yeah, because... All you have to do is look at verse, let's see over here, let's look at verse um, 3, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Notice over here that at verse 3, the nations drunk what? The wine and wrath of her fornication. That's spiritual, right? Isn't that same thing with chapter 17, verse 2? Mm -hmm. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, it's all that spiritual fornication going on. Not only that, verse 4, 
talks about a golden cup in her hand. Yes? That's what the Catholic Church practices. Notice how this matches up with verse 6. In the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. See that? It's religious here. Another one, verse 13. It describes all of commerce. But look at the last part. Souls of men. See, this is religious again. Look at, <clears throat> let's look at hmm, verse 24. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Look at that. That matches with the Roman Catholic Inquisition and that matches with chapter 17. Verse 6. She has the blood of the martyrs in her hand. See that? So notice over here, this is all referring to the same Babylon. It makes more sense to combine spiritual and secular Babylon together. That makes way more sense. That makes way more sense.